dipped in in blood and he comes with an army uh, on horses. Very much different than the picture we have been given in Matthew 24 and conversely uh, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2. So we can see distinct events. We then can, uh, what can we say about this second coming or this other event that is happening in Revelation 19? It's about a war. In uh, Matthew 24 and also in uh, 1 Thessalonians, he's coming to, he's coming to redeem, right? And gather up his saints. No, no war indicated there. In fact, you, it's quite the opposite, right? No war, no wrath being indicated, but rather um, his mercy, his gathering up of the saints, his promise that he gave uh, to the people, his promise to return and uh, the place that he had prepared for us. Now he's coming to get us, right? So we can again see this uh, clear distinction between uh, Revelation 19 and Matthew 24. So we know with some reasonable assurity, again, that these are separate and distinct events. Now, the idea then right uh that uh, so here's where here's where it kind of gets tricky if if second thessalonians is suggesting that the wrath occurs immediately after the rapture right that we just read in second thessalonians or that we read last week in second thessalonians uh chapter one uh, uh specifically i think verse 10 but six six seven and ten and it sort of made that implication, right, that the rapture occurs and then immediately after the, uh, the wrath uh, begins, we know that we know that if the, the wrath is beginning, but we also know that this wrath takes at least a full year. How do we know that? Because when we look through the trumpets and the vials, we already have a estimate in the trumpets of at least five months in just the fifth trumpet alone, right? Then also, we were given a hint when we, when we studied or talked about Noah. We were given a hint. And also, uh, we know that the seasons of our Lord follow a year each of the uh each of the main um how do i want to say the main uh seasons that we are to celebrate uh com you know consistently uh practice occurring with rosh hashanah the the new year and then going on through uh yom kippur and sukkot the the tab the um the tents and then going on through passover and and pentecost and so forth we see that taking a full year w knowing the lord as we now have become to know that he has a pattern right a pattern for everything in noah we saw that there was a full year and 10 days that noah was in the ark from the shutting of the door and who did the shutting? God did the shutting. Noah didn't shut the door. God shut the door, right? And he was in that ark for a year and 10 days. And you can uh, go back and we covered this last week. Uh, but um, he was 500 uh, years old when he started building the ark. He was 600 years old when he went into the ark. And then the scripture says when he came out of the ark, he was 601 and then the verse goes on to describe uh, the 10 days. So the one year and 10 days. So how long might the wrath be? 
the entirety of the wrath might be a year and 10 days because the entirety of the flood, which is the first uh, type, right? That was the first type of wrath. That was the judgment that God brought upon uh, those folks in that day. And uh, if God is a God of consistency, as we have come to understand him to be, then we could assume or establish that there might be a year and a half, a year and 10 days of this wrath, of this wrath from uh, the first trumpet on through uh, the last vial. Even though the rapture may occur and then the wrath may immediately begin after, right? We don't even know, we don't know the actual uh, time frame because all we get a hint of is that there was 30 minute silence. If you remember reading that uh, in chapter Revelation chapter 7, as we were talking about uh, uh, the sixth seal, Revelation chapter 7 describes that 30 minutes of silence. There's the rapture. Is that is that the 30 minutes that the the awe of God, the the when the when what we just read about the angels singing hallelujah, right? And all of the folks being gathered up, could that be occurring in that 30 minutes? And in that silence, or is that silence, you know, immediately after the rapture has begun because when you get a picture of this coming to the um coming to the 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 marriage supper right coming to the marriage supper so we're talking about now Christ has come to redeem his bride to come to gather up his bride the church the saints those written in the book of life uh, we all have been given our white robes if you remember that in uh, Revelation uh, 6 and 7 and so forth, we we see that we were meeting him in the air. And then uh, what do you remember what he said about with some of those saints? He said, be, be, be relaxed, you know, uh, be at rest for a little while until the fullness of the prophecy is achieved right so we know that there that 30 minutes and remember <laughs> remember that with god right we just read this last night that with god one day is as a thousand years in peter and a thousand years is as one day so if that is the case so this 30 minutes might could i mean we could be talking about a a, a few years here right i mean we don't we don't know we know that we know that the indication uh in daniel is that the um is that the the seven year uh week right the seven year week is is seven years so we know that there aren't hundreds and hundreds of years uh from this uh rapture to the wrath but we know that there's a bit of time a bit of time happening before the wrath actually begins at least we could say this 30 minutes and so then we know that then the wrath begins because of what we read in Second Thessalonians. And then we have, again, some time markers in comparison with Noah and also with the trumpets that perhaps this wrath is carried out in a year and a half, a year and 10 days, excuse me. And so also what we see going happening at the same time, if you recall, is that the witnesses the two witnesses at the midpoint, right? The midpoint of the seven years. So that's three years, three and a half years in after the signs begin, after the tribulate, you know, the, the beginning of sorrows and then things escalate and you know, all of the, the tumults, the pestilences, the famines, etc., uh, of the beginning of sorrows. And then uh, as we move toward the rapture, uh, we see other events occurring, the uh, abomination of that makes desolate. Uh, so that means uh, the Antichrist is going to declare himself to be God sitting or standing in the holy place. Right. And that leads us right up into then uh, 
Revelation 7, where the rapture begins. And, and we, we should know, too, with that, that midpoint occurring is the same time because the, the, the witnesses are said to witness and preach for 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. So either there, either these events have to be overlapping, right? Because you only have seven years to work with. So they have to be overlapping in some sense. I mean, you, you only have seven years to work with. You can't, you know, you can't squeeze a hundred years into seven. Well, I guess God can do anything, right? But <laughs> from our, our mere uh, human logic, if you have se- seven years, it's seven years. And we also know that God is very accurate as well because he gave a specific time to Daniel of 490 years. Uh, and when we begin to study Daniel, we will see where that is pointed out. So now we we have a we have a good reference point of when this is occurring and we know now that there is clearly a distinction between the rapture and the second coming. And then there is this idea that okay, Jesus was on the earth when he was um ministering to people uh, when he came in flesh to be amongst the people and do his ministry. His feet, you know, he was literally physically on the earth, right? He walked, he talked, he he sat with the disciples and so forth. So he was on the earth at that point. So one could imagine or postulate that that was his first coming, right? When he was born, he was here, he lived, he was on the earth at that point. Then he was, he himself was raptured, right? The first resurrection. Uh, being the first fruits, as we just talked about a couple of weeks ago. And those saints who were resurrected with him at that time, being referred to as the first fruits. Then he goes into heaven to be with his father, sitting at the right hand of the throne. And what was he doing all that time? All of this time, uh, he was interceding on our behalf. He had, he had, sacrificed himself so that we do not have to have the sting of death he sacrificed himself and he eradicated he eradicated give gave us forgiveness eradicated the debt that we would have to pay we don't have to go and uh make animal sacrifices anymore because Jesus himself was the final and best sacrifice. The only true pure lamb of God being able to sacrifice and atone, pay for what we should have rightly had to pay for in our sins. And he covered his blood was so magnificent, is so magnificent that it has covered our sins past present and future if we believe and receive his gift in other words he already made the down payment he already made the down payment and uh, you know back in the day of uh, lay when layaways were popular Right, you go in and you put down your down payment, and they hold it for you, right? And then we've heard uh, we've heard blessings of people going in and paying off all of the layaway uh, bills that people had. You've heard about that, particularly at uh, Christmas time and so forth. Some uh, person will go in uh, and pay off the layaways that people have had at different different stores. And oh, what a blessing that is. Well, God has done that. He's paid off our layaway. All those sins that, that we have accumulated and will accumulate that we would have had to pay for, 
God has paid for it. The sin debt is already paid, but you have to accept the gift. Now, imagine 